Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we appreciate you being here at the Washington County Commission meeting, and we'd like to welcome you all here. And starting out our meeting, we have uh, two of our, we are just talking about regulars. Uh, uh, Tim Martin will give our invocation. He is from the Interfaith Council, representing the Church of Jesus Christ. And also Dan Greathouse is um, here as well, president of the Vietnam Veterans Chapter here locally, and, and um, we thank him for his service, and we appreciate Tim giving us our invocation. Yeah, let me just, uh, on behalf of the Interfaith Council, thank you for working this out. Um, it's a great exposure, I think, for you to all the other churches. We have 22 churches in Interfaith Council, and they look forward to being here. Uh, I schedule all those people to come, and if they're not here, I just want to say it's Cheyenne's fault. So, uh, <laughs> no, we appreciate them. It's but it is, it's, it's really good both ways, so thank you very much. Please join me in a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful this day for the opportunity we have to live in this wonderful land, in this special place of the world, that we might enjoy the freedoms that we have, that we might enjoy the great camaraderie, the great community spirit that we have here in Washington County. We're thankful for these commissioners and their staff and the great service that they provide for the work that they put in. We're thankful for their desire to make our lives richer. And we pray thy blessing to be upon them now as we begin this meeting, that they might feel thy inspiration, that they might know those things that will help serve the citizens of Washington County. We pray for a blessing upon those who might speak, that they might be able to present those thoughts in a manner that they've worked on, that they have thought about, and would accurately represent the situation that they hope to describe. We're thankful for the many wonderful people that make our lives better, make our lives richer. And we ask thy blessing now to be upon all of us and be upon this meeting. And this we ask in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Take all eyes, please. Show me the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Be seated. So both Commissioner Cox and Commissioner Renstrom have been priding themselves on going paperless. I'm kind of sticking to the old school, but uh, it's, uh, it's paid off right now. So. Dean is going to go computerless. Too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Commissioner Cox is going to go computerless there for a minute. So, well, thank you very much. Um, our first item on our agenda is our consent agenda. The consent agenda is a means of expediting routine matters which come before the commission for approval. The consent portion of the agenda is approved by one non-debatable motion. If any commissioner wishes to remove an item from the consent portion of the agenda, it becomes the first order of business on the regular agenda. So Mr. Chairman, I'd like to pull one property from the real property section, or the abatement section. It's uh, account number 0917518. Um, I just think we're, we need at least the best some additional information. So that'll be the first item on the agenda. So I would second the motion to approve the consent agenda with that exception. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. aye. The motion passes. So now we have uh, That's the this idea. item um, before us. Uh, the property adjustment uh, number 0917518. So I make a motion that we deny their request for abatement um, at, and at, send it back to them saying that they at least have to provide additional information. I'll second that motion. We have a motion and a second to deny and request additional information. All in favor say aye. 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 The motion passes. Our first item of business is. Um, Consideration of purchase request, uh, Mark Blanche. Well, commissioners, <clears throat> our first one today is for the attorney's office. And this is uh, some grant money they have to uh, use online profile for, for some reports they have. And this is for $10,000. 
The next one we have is for emergency services. And this is a, a grant money that they have, and this will be a regional pur purchase for the five counties since we are the administrating uh, county for that. And this is uh, for, for communication software to be able to reach out to each one of the five counties and also the cities that are within those counties. Uh, and uh, Pete's here if you have any questions about that or would like him to give you more information about that. Inf Pete, about is that, that some sort of web-based? It is. It's a, a web-based incident management system called WebEOC. The state uses that system, so does FEMA, so do some of our adjoining states. In 2010, for example, as we were sharing information on that system with the state, com communities downstream were watching what was happening in Washington County, so it helped them ramp up and prepare. FEMA Region 8 was watching it so that they could get their teams ready to come in once we reached a disaster level. It will allow us to interface all five counties seamlessly to list our resources and have those mapped out so that in an emergency we can look at the closest resource to come in from different areas within the region. Um, in addition to that, it has an incident action planning software that goes in there that allows us to set up incident action plans through the event uh, in the emergency operations center. So is it will replace. Is the $66,000 covered for three years or is that one That's year? That's one year. year. That's one, one year, three, three years. years. Oh, it's okay. paid for with us HSP grant funding. The first two years of we've already been told are funded. So the third year would be funded once that grant becomes available. Thank you, Pete. Thank yeah, you. So, so the total there is $66,665. Uh, the last ones that we have are all for the road department. And this is for asphalt, and st asphalt for different uh, roads in the county. Uh, the first one that they've uh, uh, brought forth is those areas that are being asphalted is Turkey Farm uh, and uh, Shivowitz and uh, Brookside, Baker Dam Central and Pine Valley. And that one is for $66,456.42. Uh, the next one uh, that they've submitted uh, is for, uh, again, for the same thing for uh, Bench Road, uh, Bentley Lane, and uh, West Enterprise. And then the third one uh, for them is for is all for West Enterprise, and that is, well, that second one, is, the total there is $69,878.18. And then the next one is for West Enterprise, and that one is for $83,751.78. And the uh, last one is for West Enterprise also, and it is for $33,013.92. And for that's, Western Emulsions. Yes. Those were all budgeted? Uh, yes, they, they have enough money in their budget to cover it, yes. I have one question, Ron, or is West Enterprise all in the county? Is that what? Or did we do some work for Enterprise the Town? The city of Enterprise is annexed a portion of it. We started outside of their bounds and just did the county board. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, so Thanks. that's the ones we have for today, Commissioners. Mr. Chairman, I'd make a motion that we approve the purchase request as presented by our uh, deputy purchasing agent, uh, Mark Black. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. At this uh, point in the agenda, I'd like to accept a motion to moderate the agenda, to make modification, modify the agenda to move item 11 uh, up onto the agenda, if that's okay. To no, where at? So we will take care of item 11 right now and then, then proceed with the agenda. I'd make that motion. I'll, I can take that. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye, the motion passes. So item 11 that has now become item two is consideration of resolution R-2017-2240, uh, uh, a resolution in favor of expanding the Red Cliffs Desert Reserve to include the area northwest of Bloomington and approving a modified uh, Washington Parkway route to create net positive results for the threatened desert tortoise. Uh, Cameron, this is your item. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Um, 
So about a year and a half ago, the HCP permit expired. And since then, we've been in negotiations to renew our permit. And one of the complicating issues that we've had, um, well, there's several, but most of the, the complicated issues involve the possibility of alternative mitigation. And if there's any out there, what does that look like? And so Washington County took on the initiative that we need to determine what kind of mitigation potential is out there to help solve some of these different issues that we've got. And we've had a lot of different reports of tortoises occurring west of St. George in the Bloomington area, Green Valley Gap area. And so Washington County hired a few tortoise biologists and our own staff as well. And we went out there to begin surveying some of these areas to look for desert tortoise and, and the desert tortoise habitat. This is the area that we went out to everywhere in the, that cross hatched, cross -hatched um, areas. It's about 3,000 acres of Sitla land and about just over 2,000 acres of BLM land. We, we wanted to go into the Red Bluff ACEC to, to cover more area close to the Sitla <coughs> properties, um, but there's some sensitive plants and soils and the BLM didn't authorize us to go in there, but we, we took a different approach to kind of look for tortoises out there that I'll ex explain in just a minute. This is a more zoomed in version of where we went to. Um, those are the actual transects that we walked. There's 230 lines there separated by 60 meters each, and we walked a total of 342 kilometers. <laughs> and we found a lot of tortoises. Um, we knew we'd find a few, but we found way more tortoises than what we were expecting. Uh, we found large adults, we found medium-sized little ones, and baby hatchlings as well. In total, we found 78 desert tortoises. 56 of those were live adult animals. 22 were juvenile tortoises. On the right-hand side here, you can see um, geographically where those animals occurred on the landscape. And then on uh, this other side, that's where all the other sign was, burrows, scat, tracks. So those aren't alive animals, but that represents where there was a lot of tortoise activity. And again, this is just to remind you, we wanted to get into that ACEC, but um, due to those constraints, we, we couldn't get in there. So what we did instead, um, they only allow people on the authorized trails. And so we, we put signs up at the, all the major trailheads on the ACEC and the adjacent Sitla lands. And we asked our citizens who were using those trails to submit their tortoise observations back to us. Um, and this was also highly successful. They almost immediately started reporting their tortoise observations. As you can see, there's you know them with their bikes and their helmets. and. Most of the observers seemed to be on mountain bikes, but there were other people who were just hiking or even driving by some of these areas as well. They found 49 adult desert tortoises and approximately 17 juvenile tortoises. It's kind of hard to tell from a picture if it was an adult or juvenile, but that's our best estimate. A total of 66 tortoises and about nearly 30% of those were juveniles. So this shows you um, the results of where those tortoises occurred. And as you can see, it was west of our survey area on the Red Bluff ACEC, and then much further north, all throughout the Santa Clara River Reserve. There was a lot of tortoise activity up there as well. So well beyond our survey area, there still is a lot of, of tortoise sign and tort live tortoises. This gives you a better idea of how large the whole geographic area is for tortoises. Um, this includes all of our survey results, the citizen science data, um, and then also observations from the past from Division of Wildlife, from BLM and Fish and Wildlife Service. And it gives you an idea of the, it's called a minimum convex polygon. What's kind of the minimum occupied tortoise habitat on that landscape? And uh, we just kind of connected the outermost dots to show where tortoises occur. And it's nearly 38,000 acres. One of the reasons why this area might be an important place to protect is its location relative to the recovery units of the desert tortoise. The Red Cliffs Desert Reserve is located in the Upper Virgin River Recovery Unit. The next one to the west is the Northeastern Mojave Recovery Unit. And as it is right now, um, the Red Cliffs Desert Reserve is a little bit isolated from the next recovery unit. It's, it's kind of a, a, an island population in a way. Our survey area is much closer to the Mojave, the Northeastern Mojave Recovery Unit. And then just to the southwest there, you have um, habitat that links the two recovery units. And these areas are already pretty well protected because there's a BLM wilderness area and ACEC. So it's, it's a good thing that th that's already protected for tortoise conservation. Um, but the survey area, much of that is not, at least the, the Sitla portions certainly are not. The, the ACEC parts are 
a little bit more protected. But the, the Sitla lands are fully developable. One of the other neat things that we found on our survey was just a, a variety of other species. The dwarf bear poppy up there in the corner is a, a federally listed plant species, and it was very abundant, even on the Sitla properties that we surveyed. Uh, Holmgren milkvetch was another plant that we found that's a listed plant. And then these other animals are state-sensitive species that we found, Gila monsters, chuckwallas, kit fox. And so protection of this area wouldn't just benefit the desert tortoise, but it would benefit other listed and state-sensitive species. So just to kind of cap everything and, and summarize it, we surveyed over 5,000 acres, 3,000 acres of which were the, the Sitla properties. We found 78 tortoises on those surveys and, and lots of tortoise sign throughout all of the, all of the survey area. Um, if you look at the abundance estimate from just that survey area, it was 468 desert tortoises. And that's just over the 5,000 acres. If you extrapolate that over 20 or 30,000 acres, you're looking at a population of tortoises well over 1,000 animals. Um, our density estimate was 22 and a half tortoises per square kilometer, which is extremely high. That's probably one of the highest known populations anywhere. The, re the reserve itself is 15.3 which is significantly higher than any of the other recovery units. And so this portion of our recovery unit is actually even higher than the reserve. So it, it seems to be very outstanding habitat for desert tortoise. Another key observation was that 30% of our observations were juvenile tortoises. And that is much higher than the normal encounter. Normally when they're doing surveys in the rest of the Mojave Desert, only about 12% of their observations are juveniles. So this seems to be a young and growing reproductive population, which is really neat. And we only found four dead tortoises. So four dead tortoises compared to 78 live tortoises also shows that there's really high survivorship. Typically, you'll see anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of dead animals, where ours is much lower than that as well. The other uh, key take home is that the citizen science was a, a great project, not only to get the data from the citizens themselves, but it helps them take a little bit of ownership of those areas of their public lands that they can enjoy appreciate and learn a little bit more about. But their data clearly showed that tortoise distribution continues far north of our survey area and far west as well. Um, and then also this, this area might be a really important link between our two recovery units. Um, and then finally, it's, it's a, a great resource to protect other animals, not just the desert tortoise. So that's all I've got for you. So and, uh -huh. can I ask a question? I was just going to just thank everybody. There was a lot of people who helped, but that, that's all. Yeah. So when I talk to Bob Sandberg, I says, uh, a former biologist, he, I says, why would this area have so much young tortoises? Like, what's going on here? And he represented, he says, well, one of the great threats to the young tortoises is coyotes, crows, that type of thing. And human activity will generally chase those predators away. Did the other biologists that were out here looking at that, did they, like, were there signs of coyotes out there or? There certainly was ravens. I remember seeing lots of ravens. You see those throughout the whole yeah. county, though. Um, the kit foxes, I showed you those. I don't, I, I'm sure somebody had to have seen coyotes. Um, okay. They're out there. But again, we, we, we have a bounty on coyotes. Um, compared to a lot of these other places in California and Nevada, their, their coyote po populations are much higher than ours. And so there, that probably comes into play as part of it. The other thing is that Utah is just blessed with a little bit more rainfall than the Mojave Desert and a little bit better terrain and habitat compared to those areas. And so I think tortoises just naturally thrive here a little bit better. So it's a combination of those things. Okay. I think one of the things that's very interesting about this study is that this is an intensely recreated area. I mean, you have a tremendous amount of mountain biking and just recreation out there. It's very close to human, mm -hmm. you know, where people live. and so. It shows that we can live and use and recreate the same area, which hasn't always been accepted as far as uh, the but tortoise recovery. That's very true. And I, if I go back and show you uh, on our map of where these tortoises occurred, it was kind of curious that some of the most heavily recreated areas is where we actually found some of the most dense populations of desert tortoises. And, and we don't know exactly why that is. I've got some speculative theories, but um, that area up in kind of the north, cent north central region is right by the Green Valley Gap Trailhead. There's a lot of tortoise activity up in there. And then this other area down here in the corner, and, and even going back to the citizen science, it shows you on the trails right there, that's the Navajo Drive, that's the Bear Claw Poppy Trail. And there's just a ton of tortoise activity in that area as well. One of the recreationists 
um, even said that he had seen seven tortoises on one bike ride on that trail. So wow. there's, a, there's a lot of tortoise activity in some of those areas. And, and how all of them got here in the first place, you know, it's always been debatable. Um, but we know that some of these were potentially released at some of these locations just because it, it seems like that would be the most convenient place to drop off a tortoise. And perhaps that's why you have tortoises at a higher abundance there. We don't know for sure if that's the answer. But even one of the tortoises that um, one of the citizens sent us the photo of it, it had a hole drilled in its shell. It was somebody's former pet once upon a time. <laughs> so we know it happens. We just, it's hard to keep track of. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, thank Appreciate you. you. Let's see, well, we're going to have uh, Aaron Baker speak to the, to the route alignment and discussion on that with Horrocks Engineering. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commission. Yes, I'm Aaron Baker from Horrocks Engineers. Get this started here. Um, I was uh, asked by our uh, Dixie Metropolitan Planning Organization um, to help them to come up with some, some, uh, I guess, just some some validity of some of the sketches that we have of a possible location of a northern corridor in the uh, in the northern area of in the reserve, and that's. And that's, this is essentially just a, a quick s summation of, of, of what we did. And, and these, um, these lines just represent some of, the, some of the lines that we've sketched out on maps that could possibly happen um, in this area to, uh, to try to obtain a, a, a connection from Washington Parkway in Washington, just above at the top of Green Springs, to connect uh, over to Red Hills Parkway, which is a, a very well-traveled road that is it's also in the reserve, but a, a location there to connect. So these are, these, are, these are just lines just showing some of the, the areas that we've considered, um, considered looking at. And this is a, an example of the type of road that we're looking at. It's a, it is a corridor. It's not, it's not just a road. It's, it's, it's a multifaceted um, purpose in this corridor. It's, it's a utility corridor. It, um, it, it, it's a multimodal. So um, what we're looking at here is this is two directions of traffic, so that's kind of the, the, the darker stripes with the line down the middle. There's median in the middle, and then on the left side, or on the, I'm sorry, on the right side is a trail that would be for pedestrians and bicyclists, and this is very similar to what we have on Red Hills Parkway. So this, it's a um, kind of an ultimate width. One day we'll, um, looking at the volume of traffic that will be on this road, this is ultimately what it would look like. So on every one of those lines, we considered um, a cross section or a roadway size similar to this one. Um, we have an original line that we've had on our maps for years that has kind of shown, a, a connect, shown one of the connections. And it, and it goes through um, kind of the heart of some areas of the reserve. This was one of the options that we looked at. Um, another one that has, that has come up that uh, it's called what we call the blue line. We just, lab we just labeled it a blue color. But this is the, the furthest south southern line in, in this area, and it's kind of closest to the urbanized area of St. George. And this is a, a, uh, a biological approved, but it, engineering wise, it can work. It's one that, that we've taken a look at. It doesn't have any fatal flaws. It's not too steep. Uh, it is rather steep in areas, but it's, it can it can work through this through this reserve, and so this is really the 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 recommendation that that we have at this time, that is part of the resolution and is attached to the map in the resolution. Uh, that's essentially the the one that we wanted to look at, and if if you had any questions on on how we arrived at that or. Uh, I just a couple of questions, Aaron, about how many acres would this new route take if we build it at a projected right-of-way width that you're anticipating? And your question is how many acres south of the road or the, no, what the road is actually the taking? Itself. 
I th and I'm just trying to recall on memory. It's, I think it's like 180 acres, something like that. It's a 300, it's a 300 foot wide footprint for 4.5 miles. And I think this one is actually a little longer. I think this is 4.6 miles. But that's, that's the area. Mm -hmm. so and, and the reason the biologist wanted the line moved south was? <clears throat> they were, their, their, their hope is to try to have as, as large a contiguous area that they could to kind of preserve the, the, their habitat space so it wouldn't be bisecting their, that area. And so this further south um, just kind of takes strips of the, of the reserve out of the reserve in, instead of, you know, essentially bisecting a, you know, a populated area for, for tortoises. So I've got to, are you, are you finished? Well, I was just going to make a comment. I, I think this is uh, one of the most intriguing proposals that we've, we've had a chance to visit on for many, many years where uh, working with a lot of different stakeholders, including Fish and Wildlife and the Department of Natural Resources, the BLM at a state and local level, uh, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, MUDOT, and, and really looking at how we could come up with a win uh, for everyone. And uh, especially CITLA has been uh, a valuable entity that, that owns so much land that has the potential of being developed that would work with the county and the other stakeholders to protect that land for the benefit of the tortoise, bringing uh, potentially thousands and thousands of additional acres into the reserve. And simultaneously, I see this as being very congruent with what we've wanted to do with Vision Dixie, where we preserve our signature scenic landscapes and view sheds, as well as simultaneously enhance and protect uh, the opportunity to walk and recreate. And uh, with the Northern Corridor, uh, you've got an impact of somewhat less than 200 acres, but being able to bring thousands of acres of mitigation in and uh, a long-term commitment from the county of at least 20 years uh, for the life of the HCP to uh, do that. I, I see this as, as really a potential win-win. And so I speak in favor of the resolution. I think it uh, is the most responsible alternative that we've really had a chance to look at in terms of mitigating uh, adverse impacts for the tortoise and with the uh, Gardner Institute's uh, recently released population studies that show Washington County with uh, a burgeoning population by the year 2040, that if we can't establish a, a good viable east-west route, then we're apt to suffer from gridlock on the boulevard at 700 South and 100 South, where we're so limited because of the geography with uh, Black ridges on each side of the valley and the Virgin River and, and everything working against an efficient uh, transportation network. I think this keeps our commute times uh, more reasonable and that will cut down on air pollution and, and just go a lot to keep our uh, quality of life here in Washington County for both the tortoise and the other species that live on all of this land that we would be willing to protect. So, so Aaron, uh, just a couple of questions. Towards the left side, the road looks like it kind of makes a heads to the north really quick, right there. Is there a reason why it shot to the north and not just make a straight line into the right? So there's the existing parking lot. So yeah, well, so yeah, why can't we just go straight? Oh, just go straight here. There is a pedestrian crossing that's really close that oh. we were respecting at the time. Okay. That, that could definitely be altered and changed when you're talking about a project of this scope. Okay. But that's effectively why we did that. And then, so, can, where's Cameron? So I know on the other road, Red Hills, 
there's some tunnels or I don't know, some culverts for tortoises. Uh -huh. And I know you and I have talked about it, and you said those have worked. Um, what else can we do, let's say, on this road to help mitigate those tortoises kind of going back and forth? Well, to a certain extent, they've certainly worked. We don't know the full story yet, but tortoises are definitely going in there a lot. But they seem to use them more as shelters, but they do occasionally cross. Um, in order to keep genetic flow, you only need a few animals over five to ten year span to, to be passing their genes to keep the, the population strong and healthy. So in the long term, I think they're going to be effective. What will be even more effective with, with this road, as I've heard it engineered, there's, there's two sections that are going to be on stilts as it crosses that black ridge on each side. So that would allow, certainly allow for passage of desert tortoises much easier than a culvert. It's just going to, I mean, people could walk under it. So um, there should be far less problems with that in terms of cutting off the habitat and fragmentation. Oh, thanks. And then I, I don't know which one. Is this one, look, this route, I know there's the old landfill right there. It seems like this route avoids that. Is that correct? Um, it's, it's immediately adjacent to it. Okay. Yeah, the landfill, if I can get this to work, is like right in this area. Okay. Perfect. Those are. Well, I, yeah, I think we have a motion and, and probably a second. Uh -huh. I would just speak to this really quickly. I think, uh, you know, Great work has been going into this. Commissioner Cox has been leading out on this. Of course, this has been a multi-decade conversation as Mother Nature has created very interesting topography. The very topography that we love is also is quite difficult for engineers to route roads and traffic around. Um, and I think we're trying to, to meet in the middle here, not only with identifying mitigation anchorage. And I will say this, and. I believe the 2009 lands bill promised us the Northern Corridor and, and I feel bad that we have to fight so hard for it now when Congress and the President signed for it before. And so I'll just put that on the record. I also will say on the record that I'll accept whatever option we can compromise for, but I hope that the biologist will work with the landscape opposed to just wanting to work with the map and get us the most southerly route. That being said, this southerly route does identify already that um, we're going to have the highest traffic, uh, so most bang for our buck on traffic flows, right? On the on the west side of Turkey Farm Road, you will have some of the higher volumes. Right. On the east side, not as high, but on the west, it will definitely. Well, did we have an official motion or? Yeah, I would make that motion in support. So, so would you mind if I make a friendly? Yeah. Request is. Right after the whereas that talks about the Sitla Trust land, if we could add the paragraph, whereas the recreational, um, the, rec the recreation that is currently occurring on the Utah Sitla and Institute Trust Land Administration also be protected if the land is transferred to the habitat conservation area. I just, that area is used by a lot of people. And I just so want is that on paragraph five? So it would be no, one, four? two, three, four. So it would be, yeah, insert paragraph four. I, just, I would accept that as a friendly amendment. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion with the amendment that's been entered into the record. Do we have a second? Oh, we have a second? If you can read my notes. <laughs> um, a second, sorry. All those in favor say aye. 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 Item passes. Thank you so much. Appreciate okay. it. You're very welcome. I'd, I'd like to also recognize uh, Dave Demas and Myron Lee uh, from our Metropolitan Planning Organization and recognize their uh, countless hours of effort uh, as we've worked on this project over the past several months. They've, they've really uh, stepped up and, and uh, worked hard to help answer questions and work with the county on this uh, proposition. Absolutely. I think throughout this conversation on the Northern Corridor, the County Commission has made it abundantly clear that it's our intent to have a transportation route that honors the landscape it goes through, that, that totally is a, is a net win for the tortoise. And I, I, th I think that all of our actions would be deemed that, or would demonstrate that. So anyway, we'll appreciate that, appreciate everybody's participation. We'll move on with our regular agenda, which is consideration of the George Fest uh, sponsorship, and I'll turn the time over to Dean. For that. I'd, I'd like to speak to that, uh, commissioners. In our last meeting when uh, we considered several proposals, a question came up at the time 
that I had on the George Fest, and it was whether or not they were tax exempt, and because it was stated that their application stated that they were. And as I went home that evening and had a chance to reflect on it a little bit, I, I, I wasn't sure if that was exactly accurate, and, and it was a bit confusing. In fact, maybe uh, we can get Eric to speak to a little bit of his findings on that. But I asked that we uh, hold off payment of that, uh, or delivering the payment of that, until we had a chance to discuss it uh, openly in a, in a forum to make sure that we're making uh, an absolutely correct decision. Uh, when the application stated they were a 501c3, uh, I wondered about that because uh, having recently gone through an, uh, an election experience, uh, I was the uh, involved with uh, one of the other candidates that they editorialized in support of. and. I just didn't know if it was consistent for a 501c3 to be involved in uh, that type of activity. Now, my research since then has shows that uh, they've attempted to make a change in that 501c3 and, and maybe with Melinda Thorpe here she could speak to that and uh, let us know what that status is and what are those concerns that I have have been adequately addressed. Very good, very good. I'll um, allow Linda to speak to this if she would like. Uh, once she comes up, I, I will say that we have this item and several others as far as the funding for, for different tourism related items. And, and uh, we as a county commissioner are trying to, um, there's a little bit of, there's been a little bit of confusion on our part where our staff has not fully understood or explained the process to the applicants that that the allocation of funds reside in the legislative body of the county commission. And so any sort of a promise or commitment for funds has to come before this body. And we also need it to come before it in a, in a more, with, with enough time in order for this to be considered in case there are items that, that need to be considered. Because in my, I think we have several items that, I mean, it's almost, you know, the, the cows left the barn, so to speak. And so, um, <laughs> but anyway, um, George Fest is a, is a, is a well-known brand. I think we're on your third year. Mm -hmm. um, of course, with this, and I'll just say my one editorial, and then, then this way you can respond. I mean, anytime a private organization uses public space and public funds to generate private profits, there has to be a certain amount of um, uh, public benefit that follows that, and that has to, to, to weigh in to, to how and why and I, and I think your, your argument as far as, I mean, I support overall the, the concept of, of what you've done or what you attempt to do, but, but there is this extra scrutiny that, that mm -hmm. is much different than another business. So. Well, just to speak to that, that is um, certainly part of the reason we decided to transition from a private entity running um, the event to a nonprofit organization. Essentially, the private entity was necessary to launch an event like this. Um, we appreciate the partnership we've had with St. George City, um, but it became evident that for the, the event to continue long term, it needed to have um, a nonprofit infrastructure. So I'm not, I'm not aware of an editorializing. Um, I would be offended um, if it were construed in any way that George Fest has supported any particular candidate. We do provide products. So we have a playbill much like the Shakespeare Festival or Tuacon um, that anyone can purchase an advertisement in. And I know um, that neither one of those playbills um, require any kind of restriction. Anyone can, any political candidate can pay for an ad in those publications just like in George Fest. We also sell booth space, um, and I have always required that any political candidate pay full price for the booth space, so there is no um, show of favoritism. I am um, savvy in my career enough to know that we do not show favoritism to political candidates. Should they be involved in an event like this? Absolutely. They're part of the community. Um, one thing that we ran into is political candidates wanted to hand out flyers at the event, and 
requiring them to purchase a booth space if they wanted to participate was a way for us to control um, them in their advocating for themselves. So those are the two ties that I am aware of um, in terms of any relationship to politi political activities whatsoever. Um, further questions? Well, I, I guess my, what I'd add to that, so you're saying that any sort of, um, anything would have been purchased, like if it, if it, if it appeared it would have been purchased. Um, I guess I would, I would just caution, you know, I know, for example, there are some festivals. I, I, I know, for example, in the county fair, there was a particular candidate that wanted to have her endorsement on the t-shirt. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we said, no, not on the t-shirt. You can have the booth, you know, you can do that, but we're not, we're not going to put, put it on the t-shirt. And um, we get back to this, you are kind of this <laughs> public, almost community event. A lot of people probably don't even know that George Fest is not St. George City. And so... Um, I'd be willing to, to support the sponsorship if you'll give me kind of the commitment that you'll make effort to, to, to have within just practice common sense. Common I mean, sense. I wouldn't want this to cut anyway. In other words, us, we're all candidates here in a few years, and we wouldn't want it to appear that there was favoritism based on a vote of sponsorship either. So you can kind of well, appreciate that. Absolutely appreciate that and appreciate the um, learning process. This has been, we've always been conscientious of candidate involvement and tried to be very careful about how we handled that. But I can't speak to the future. I have yeah. actually um, stepped away from the event um, to go back to my career, although running an event is a lot of fun. Um, I'm trying to be an, a responsible adult. John Kessler, however, <laughs> he is trying to be a responsible adult. But he has taken over as board president. So speaking to the future, he probably is the one that should make the commitment on the behalf of the event. Well, speaking to the future, I won't be able to support it if I feel like there's unfair or if there's political participation. So it's kind of, but I, I totally acknowledge. I, I just, so. I, just my position, I don't feel yeah. like I'm the person that can say that. So I, I was the one that a commission meeting represented that you were a nonprofit. And that was clearly based upon your application. I guess my big concern is, is you're not. And I, and I know you emailed this kind of this thing saying, well, we're kind of trying to fall underneath this other one that's a 50C3 organization. And I, I think we're reaching out there too far. And my concern is, is, is that you came to us, made a representation, and, and I accepted that. Mm -hmm. And now the explanation I thought was very, was correct. Um, so you're saying, well, we didn't understand this stuff. And then it adds another concern is like, well, what kind of organization are we giving money to that can't even tell us what organization they are? And so, I, I mean, I, I know we have the political thing, but that brings up this whole other, other argument that we need to be careful about is, you're not a nonprofit, and maybe you are, it's under this weird thing, but if you don't... If you don't have a letter from the IRS saying yeah. that you're a nonprofit, that arts might be, and, and, and that's fine because we do give money to for-profit organizations sometimes. But the representation that you were, to me, when I see it's a nonprofit, I, I, I know that the IRS has certain requirements kicked in. So I, I probably would have asked a lot more questions. And so that's, not, that's my concern. And then, you, then I get this email saying, oh, we kind of are because we're, we're going to try to get under somebody else's 501c3. We followed after Arts to Zion, the organization. Um, there are several other organizations. Again, I think John Kessler can probably speak and maybe should be speaking in this place addressing your questions. Um, but I do know that there are several organizations in the community that receive um, community funding that are set up under Arts Inc. I know that we have our own tax ID number as a DBA. Um, so you are speaking to um, language as I understand what you're saying that seems abstract or um, misleading so, perhaps you've, you've said. Um, I don't think I can speak to that. I think that um, John Kessler needs to speak to that. Well, but I will state, I will state that I do know that we have the tax ID numbers. Um, the paperwork was submitted and I think Eric Clark and I have been emailing back and forth and perhaps he has some insight. Okay, if you're familiar with the, uh, the Fiore Center, the best way I can explain that is it's an incubation center for nonprofits. We've had groups like the St. George Opera, St. George Dance, 
Um, and there's several others right now that are under that umbrella, basically. But um, they can, in our situation, it's running as a DBA underneath the umbrella of the DeFiore Center or Arts, which is nonprofit um, and has been since the first of the year, I believe. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there are several, I know on the city level, when grants are going through with uh, the St. George Arts Commission, there was probably, I think this, this last year, we had at least five organizations that were granted money and they are recognized, and it was wrapped tax money, and they are recognized as nonprofit because it does go through the DeFiore Center or arts. So it, it, it is. Commissioner, a comment that I'll make on that is when we pass our RAP ordinance, uh, it specifies that they have to be a nonprofit. Uh, with that first funding cycle, the county commission mm -hmm. knowingly made an exception and allowed uh, MC Square uh, to represent some of these smaller not-for-profit type Not of MC things. Not MC Square, but um, as, as a bridge arts. solution to allow them to get funding while they secured their own 501c3 status. We're hesitant to really take that too far because they actually take a commission out of all of the RAP proceeds that were awarded and I think it was either 8 or 10 percent and so is there similarly a $1,500 uh, payment that would go to them for your use of that 501c3 umbrella? Yeah, so there is. The, uh, and it's quite frankly very appropriate in this situation because the Fiore Center, or the arts, um, they do all of the bookkeeping for us. So all of the checks, the fiduciary matters do go through a third party, if you will, where all the funding goes in and they pay all the checks out. And uh, so even for that service alone, it's very valuable while the organization continues to uh, continue to try, try to exist and grow. So Are you at any time going to try to secure your own 501c3? Oh, that's the plan. That's the plan. And it's like I said, it's an incubation. It's not a permanent solution, not for this event, to stay at the center. I know each commissioner kind of has their own concerns on any issue. You know, with this one particular issue, you know, like I, I started out, I, I think part of the challenge is that, that we as, as a county are going to be updating our own application process, making sure it's more thorough. I kind of feel like, you know, if, if we wouldn't have dropped the ball so much on our end, we, we would have got some of these issues resolved first. There's also, with the RAP, I mean, I think it is wholly appropriate that people that apply for the RAP get their 501C, you know, because they're very much an arts um, program. And you guys are right there bordering on, you don't know if you're arts or tourism or, you know, you're right there. And I appreciate that you're kind of in, in kind of no man's land. But at the same time, we do have other promoters who are for profit, you know, who are applying for and receiving marketing funds. But, but I think it was the whole confusion over, over the application that kind of, you know, sparked our interest, started, you know, and I think we're going to need to address that probably as a okay. county. <coughs> Sorry, Commissioner, if I can just insert, you, you may just want to double check your paperwork because with, with what I was looking at on the Utah Business Entity website, you're still not showing the creating documents as coming from, from your new 501c3 entity, but they're still showing as coming through MC Squared. And so that that's part of the stuff that okay. that I just flag is it. Yeah, that, we can get that. And that, that could be that the state has an updated stuff, but that's what it's showing online still. Yeah, I can get that for you. One last question I've got. Uh, I'm showing that $14,700 has already been spent. Was that spent before or after we initiated this discussion two weeks ago? And would these funds then be supplanting uh, money you've already spent? Or are you going to go out and spend additional money if we make this award? That, well, there's the budget we need to follow. So as, as you, the majority of it would have been spent for things that have been committed to and used up. And you try to apportion it all out. So th some, some expenses are larger expenses at the first, and then they pitter off. Um, so it's. It's hard to give an exact. I believe we operate off a reimbursement mm -hmm. type of process, so 
But I normally would prefer that the reimbursement be after the funds have been allocated and that they don't spend the money before it's been legislatively allocated. Which I think is what my main complaint is, not necessarily with you, but with our own department. Our process. And that, that's going to be something that's going to have to be remedied on our side. So. I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the $14,700, and uh, I would like to see some follow-up at some time that shows that they are making progress on the 501c3, because in, in, in my heart of hearts, if we're giving money out to for-profit entities, the county does that all the time. We'll go buy a set of tires, we'll buy oil, we'll buy gas, and they're all in business to make money. But state law requires that when we give money to for-profit entities, we contractually show what we're getting back in return for it. And uh, I think there's an implication, if not an outright requirement, that the county exchange fair value for fair value. Uh, a 501c3 does not have that stipulation placed upon it. And so, again, our concern was really uh, what is the true status of the organization? And uh, I think we'll contractually show with this approval that advertising is placed in the markets outside of St. George that will bring and draw visitors into Washington County. But uh, frankly, if I see another application that misrepresents the status of the organization, I won't support it. So that would be my motion in support of. Very good, so, we have a motion, do we have a second? I just have a, a question on it. So you, I'm very confused in the sense that you're saying that you're a DBA, but you have your own tax ID number. That does not make sense. Because when you go to the IRS, you're going to the IRS saying, we either are this company over here or this company over here. And so you're kind of telling the IRS that, no, we have enough, like it, it's, and well, so MC, I- MC Square has a related, well, I'm not gonna try to explain. Your so what are you? As I understand it, we're a DBA underneath the arts organization. So how do you have and your own tax ID number? I've been in this for two months. I'm catching okay. up. Okay. I'm catching up. <laughs> That's right. I mean, and these are these are hard questions. I agree and stuff like that. So, so yeah, I, it's arts Inc. That would make well, as, if we're a DBA under Arts Inc., then it's the Arts Inc.'s number that we've been using. So, if, if that's how you file your tax return, but they have their own separate tax ID number that they'd have to file a separate tax ID, or excuse me, tax return every year as a for-profit. If I have a meeting with them later this week, I'll be asking that. I'll figure could that you, out. So. Could you, after that <laughs> meeting, come and just visit? Sure, yeah. With us and Eric. And, yeah. And I'll, I'll second the motion unless you want to second it. I'll second that motion. Go ahead. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Nay. I, I don't know what they are yet. And, and I'll just do. so you know, I, I want you to tell you, I, I've been to George Fest, and I think it's a great organization. I, I, I would vote to keep it if I knew what you guys were. Understood. Because I think what you're, I think it's a good organization. I, I fought for you guys in the other tourism board that we had because I think it's a great event. But I think before we're, we're doing that, I just would like to know. And if you came back to me and said, this is what we are, even if you came back and said we're for profit, I, I'd understand that. So at least we know what we're voting on. And, and, and Understood. Understood. For okay. So don't take it personal why I'm voting that way. We're good, we're good. All right. All right, I really I'll be, do hope I'll be in you touch. continue to, to build success. I mean, yes. you know, but we need to have answers to these questions. All right, we'll and, be in touch. We, and thanks. I know I've taught I, just individually and stuff. We're going to try to improve our application yep. to make sure this is cleared up. So we're, I want you to know on our side, we're trying to clear it up too. So I want to apologize for the confusion for the county side of this. So we wouldn't have got it. Well, we're only two years into it, so it's, it's, it's okay. It's fine. It's understandable. Well, good. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, Thank you. Uh, just to echo Commissioner Renstrom's, I, I give ourselves about 51% of the blame on this <laughs> confusion. Right. So. Okay. Thanks. You bet. Thank you. Maybe I'll up that to 65%. <laughs> Very good. We're going to have a presentation on the county fair. Wendy Sandberg. Hey, you're hiding there, Wendy. How's it going? <laughs> Oops. Oh, 
Okay. We had a great county fair this year. This doesn't work, right? I just need to talk loud. Okay. <laughs> How do I go up? How do I get out? It's not going. I, it, my, the mouse won't go over there. Well, I know you've got a long agenda, and I was going to rush through this, and now I've just prolonged it. Well, I don't know what I did. Hey, the county fair is very important. Hey, so what? We need, the county <laughs> fair is very important. We need a, a proper presentation. We had a great time, and as we all know, and I was going to show you, we had two designs this year. One was um, based off of the Wizard of Oz, Lions, Tigers, and Bears. Oh, my, because we could get all those shows. Second of all, there's no place like home because this was our 20th anniversary at being at the fairground since 1997. So we just kind of incorporated everything and made it the, a Wizard of Oz theme, which was awesome. And <coughs> so that lightning storm you ordered was just an I did Yeah, not. it was better than fireworks. <laughs> it, was, it was something else. And maybe I can go over that and I go, Pete, where are you, Pete? When, when I get a phone call from the fire marshal and say, what do you want to do? We've got to close this thing down. Lightning's a quarter of a mile away. And I was, I was not prepared to know, but we had that good Grafton building, and we just evacuated up there, just said, have all the people. Was that the right thing to do, Pete? <laughs> so ran and got those doors open. Everybody went into the food court. We have the three buildings that everybody evacuated to, which saved our lives. It was well, the challenge is to turn the demolition derby into the mud box. So. <laughs> oh, and I've got great pictures of that, darn it. And we still had our derby. It was an hour and a half late in the mud, but we were still able to award all the prize money. Um, we couldn't, we, I was afraid that everybody would want refunds off the money, and I was not prepared to do that. And our internet sales said no refunds, and we had a lot of mad people. But when you can say the show took place, then that covered, covered us really good. Well, should I go? <laughs> yeah, it's just taking its sweet time. Oh. I don't know why the mouse stopped working. Any questions? <laughs> How many visitors did you um, did you estimate this year? We had about forty something thousand last year. Yeah, it's usually about the same. We had a loss on Saturday night, of course. Um, nobody was coming in to park, mm -hmm. so we lost parking revenue. The carnival shut down, so we lost carnival revenue that night. Um, the boxing was totally underwater. All of our cords for all the lights and um, PA system was underwater, so we didn't dare turn that on. So, so counting the cars, that's all we have to go on. Since we don't charge an admission price, we just have to c count the cars that pay, plus all the passes that we all give away. So it's around the 40,000. I think last year was higher with 43,000 people coming. And this was going to be a record year because it started off good. That was a great lightning show on Thunderstorm that you put on. Though. I mean, yeah. This might be a while. Well, let's just forget it, or what do you want to do? Just why, table why it for a minute. Why don't you just minute? tell us about it? If, uh, maybe you are finished with it, but I, my feedback on it is I thought you did a great job. I, uh, it was great. You came really, to visit uh, me. Thank you. Enjoyed uh, seeing all of the participation in, in terms of volunteers and staff, fair board that you had out at the venues, and uh, very well run show. 
It was. As always. It was good. And thanks to the support of the commission and the county for helping us with that fair. It's it's really important to all of us, I think. And, well, uh, just in town. <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to see the, the cars in the mud, and then we'll go. You just touch the F5 key and go up the thing. Okay, it's this right here. It's this up and down right here. 20 years, we put these logos in seed displays. Tokerville went to state to represent Washington County then, up there at the state. There. Um, ribbon cutting, Lyman Hafen was our Grand Marshal. This is a cool shot of coming into the fair. Lots of different things you can see there, flags, snow cones, going up the stairs to the Grafton building. This is a beautiful building and we are so lucky to have it and I can't wait to utilize it for next year. Um, had the midget wrestling in there for um, the opening show. Uh, it wasn't as attended as I thought it was going to be. I was worried about seating, but didn't need to be after all. We sat about, I had chairs, well, seating for 860 people, 500 came. It, it was a good show. <laughs> I still don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. <laughs> all I, right. I didn't know how I felt when I was cheering for. <laughs> Another country? <laughs> yeah. <Or what? laughs> yeah. It was weird, but it all came, didn't it? The bear show, very educational. He didn't do as much as he want as I wanted him to because he broke his arm. Tigers, top complement of the whole fair. They were very impressive. Lots of education. Each one of them eats 100 pounds of meat a day. Big crowds. Um, wood carver. All he wanted in payment was an electric saw. So we went to Colorland, Commissioner Cox, and bought him an electric saw, and he carved away, and he sold most of his stuff. He did a good job. It was fun he really, It was really fun. Um, we invested in a money cube. We called it the Kansas Tornado Money Cube. Um, this is our first time doing it. We didn't know how much money to allocate, but it stretched just fine. Everybody was excited to get in there and grab a little cash. Um, the most anybody got at one time in 20 seconds was 40 Two dollars, yeah. almost like you, Commissioner Iverson. Yeah. He got fifteen. We tried it out with Commissioner Iverson. <laughs> he got fifteen dollars. Had a great um, Arthur Fratelli, great magician that came from Omaha. He did sidewalk strolling too. Our train's great. Everybody loves to get on the train. Um, this is a counting contest we have. This is a coloring contest we have. We got um, cell phone charging tables that everybody was using. Um, our animal education center. We need more animals. We, we've got to get on and see. maybe people just don't raise animals very much anymore. But that's something we need to work on. 4-H horse show, beautiful quilts and exhibits from all the members of our county. Fair food. <coughs> Who's the best Wizard of Oz character? Um, the lion, Courageous Lion won. Photo booth, all the pictures were free to the public. He took over 4,000 picture strips. Boxing great, Friday night, rained out Saturday night. We had an outdoor movie planned, but the wind would not, us let, would not let us erect the movie screen, so we showed it on the Grafton gr garage door. Mm -hmm. Had a yellow brick road fun run in Hurricane. Here's our parade, our Grand Marshal Lyman and Debbie Hafen. Pioneer Award, Jewel and Shelby Fry. There's the commissioners. How'd you get that Humvee? How'd you get that army thing? Corey's. Corey's. Oh. <laughs> he tried us. Beautiful floats. And that, sh see, I didn't look up during the fair, but that was at 9.15 in the morning, and all those clouds were coming in, and I didn't look up. Cities were very supportive, had beautiful floats and their royalties. That's Hurricane baby contest and then at 1.30 it started to rain and I said that's fine let it come we don't care as long as it's good during derby let it come and I just sat there and enjoyed it we got everybody in it takes one hour to get 4,000 people into that arena and we finally got everyone in and we had all the cars out there so people could do their meet and greet go talk to the drivers inspect the cars 
We got everybody seated, and then the rain came, and then the fire marshal called and said, get to the buildings, and what do you want to do? So we evacuated to the buildings. So they went in and did this hypnotist. The hypnotist said it was the biggest crowd that he's ever had. <laughs> Matt Wetzel's in charge of our derby. He was going through some bad times and decisions that he had to make, but we decided to go ahead with it. And the people came back, and we filled the stands again, and they had their umbrellas and their ponchos, and they watched the mud <laughs> fly, and they did have a good time, and it was 75 degrees at our fair, the first time I can ever remember that. We had some good times, and the fireworks, I called Murray Goobler, I says, can you still light fireworks in the rain? And he says, I've got them covered. He said, what do you think? I'm a professional. The carnival opened up after an hour and a half, and they ran till midnight, so we kind of made, made up for that. So anyway, that's it. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you, you Wendy. Appreciate it was a good you. fair. Great. Very good. We're on the item four, um, emergency services, Sheriff Corey Pulsifer. We'll go ahead and kind of make this quick um, due to time. We've had uh, nine additional call outs since the last report um, that ended up with a total man hours of 775 hours. Um, for some reason, this last reporting, we've had a lot of people that have gotten up on top of Pine Valley and gotten um, lost off the trails. One individual got ledged up. That was a 13 and a half hour rescue uh, repelling. Um, like to thank um, our IHC Life Flight uh, for the support that they've been giving to us in the last little while. And just touch briefly on the fact that uh, this last weekend on um, Saturday and Sunday, we hosted uh, search and rescue training um, for the entire state, had people from 12 different agencies, including Arizona, um, that came in and participated. Um, Daryl Cashin had to put together with a bunch of the, our local members a bunch of scenarios training for lost person, for dive training, major medical, minor medical. Um, they even threw a couple really interesting twists in there and uh, with the local group that works with the hard of hearing the deaf um, individuals they actually came in and brought some people to come in as volunteers to go get lost mm -hmm. well when you try and find someone that's lost a lot of time we do a lot of noise things to try and get their attention and respond back well dealing with this portion of our community really changes all those dynamics and so it made all the individuals attending the training have to step outside the box and say okay what resources do we have what new techniques do we have to use if we're trying to locate somebody that can't hear. Mm -hmm. um, it was great exposure. The participants were incredible and they had a blast. Um, but it really a good two days of training um, and exposure for all the different teams across the state. So. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Sheriff. To, add to this, I, this is a search and rescue, but we had two officers that were involved in a, a shooting situation and they have been uh, the county attorney's office has cleared those officers. But I thought, I mean, it didn't happen in unincorporated. Our deputies came to help our city officers respond. And unfortunately, it's been the news quite a bit about the dog being shot. But I'm just so yeah. glad those officers were cleared. And um, With you bringing that up, you know, it's one of the interesting things. We talk about the search and rescue and all the volunteers and everything else. And um, we kind of tend to ignore those guys that yeah. are there doing the everyday job, um, whether it's those responding to calls on service, whether it's the staff that helps run the office with the civilian staff and stuff in the front office and even those ones that are working back there especially the guys working in the jail um, yep. nobody really knows what they do or what's going on um, but we're running a 500 bed facility and basically it's it's a mini city because you're providing for every need of those individuals while they're in there and uh, without the support of that staff and you know them just sitting there consistently doing their jobs and, and making things run smoothly so that we can focus on other things but uh, yeah, definitely thank them and also thank uh, the cooperation we've had from the other agencies. Uh, it was quite an ordeal. Um, they have got the clearing and we just finished up the internal affairs and so we'll be getting them back to um, work and back out on other shifts here in the next uh, two days, so. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. Item five, consideration of update of uh, Washington County Employment Policy and Procedures Manual regarding electronic door access. Eric? Yeah, so commissioners, uh, we became aware that there wasn't very much consistency on, on how some access to different doors was, was being granted to employees. We weren't aware of any issues that arose due to that, but when we became aware of the inconsistency, 
the human resources department put together a, just kind of a uniform policy that that says dictates how access will be granted to employees. All employees will have access during regular working hours, obviously, and then their supervisors can grant access after that. Well, I'm glad we're going to allow, allow them to come to work, but <laughs> it is important to keep it secure the rest of the time. So. Thank you. Thank, thanks for your work on that policy, yeah. Eric. I'd like to make a motion in support of the uh, update to the county employment <coughs> policies procedures manual regarding electronic door access. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion passes. Item six, consideration of ordinance 2017-1099-0, an ordinance amending the general licensing provision chapter of the home occupation chapter of Washington County Code. Scott Messel. Commissioners, I'll try to be quick. So in response to legislative updates that were made at the state level to uh, state code and how municipalities and jurisdictions could regulate um, home-based businesses and business licenses, the staff has proposed, we currently in our code, we have four home-based businesses. Um, they're called home occupations in our code. We have major and minor home occupations. And so in response to the requirements put on by the state we modify we are proposing to modify the ordinance to not require business licenses for minor home occupations if with that said if someone there are at there are times that people want to get a business license if people come in wanting to get a business license for a minor home occupation we would grant that to them we just wouldn't charge them the fee for it and i'll be happy to answer any questions but that's the gist how did, how did your planning commission, uh, their vote or recommendation? Uh, the planning commission unanimously recommended approval of it. Uh, one thing that they made a modification to, just one thing they added is, in our current ordinance, we have just some list of examples of major and minor home occupations. And one of them was game processing. And it was put in the major home occupation, or it was under the major home occupation. The Planning Commission felt that that should be a minor home occupation, and so it was their recommendation that it be moved to minor. I can go into more detail about that type of business if you want. So, no. I get. I, I, I used to be on a dairy farm, and I'd take animals to game processing. They can be pretty. It can be. <laughs> but if it's the occasional deer. Yeah, so. At the time we put it in, it under major was the thoughts of you know. The waste has to go somewhere when you're yeah. processing an animal, and just it gave the we felt like it gave staff an opportunity to make sure that those up that any negative effect if you're a next door neighbor to someone that's processing a lot of game. Of course, if you're doing one a year, it's not a big deal. But is there any kind of a threshold that uh, they put on it? To there wasn't any threshold put on it. They just felt like it was not impactful and recommended moving it to minor. So uh, I, my only comment is I think we should put a little cap on that one. I, I think that if we defined, yeah. defined that so that if uh, maybe you're helping your neighbor cut up yeah. his deer and it's fewer than five or something like that, I would, I would uh, propose passing the ordinance as amended with a threshold of fewer than five, yeah. five or fewer yeah, on, like on the game processing for a minor home occupation. Yeah, I like that. We have an amended motion. So it wasn't amended, it's just a motion. Oh, okay, the motion, the motion but you're amending changes, the, yeah, with the ordinance, with a bad recommended ordinance. So I'll, yeah, I'll go second this. And, and I want to thank Scott. Um, I, I think this is great. We're actually removing governmental burden yeah. from somebody that wants to start a home-based business. I think that like, this is good. So I thank you for that. Yeah. And uh, thank so I second you. that with the, Thanks with the amendment to the current proposed. We have a resolution. motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 I would agree with uh, Commissioner Renstrom. I mean, so many of our citizens have side hustles, side businesses. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's just important that we, you know, not burden them with something if all they're doing is getting mail and mailing a few packages out from their homes. Yes. So, thank thank you. you. Thanks. Okay. So don't go anywhere because <laughs> yes. uh, item seven is consideration of ordinance 2017 dash 1100-0 an ordinance rezoning a certain portion of Washington County near Leeds from A20 zone to PD zone hereafter fully described in this ordinance. Commissioners, if I may, um, 
based upon how our ordinance is written, our PD ordinance is written, it says prior to the county commission adopting a land use ordinance having to do with the zone change, that they need to review and approve the project plan. The project plan is item number, is item, agenda item number 14. And so my request or recommendation is that we move agenda item number 14 before agenda item number seven. And then I, it's the same project. I could talk about it and you, I could talk about it on a whole and then you could, if you choose, approve the resolution and then approve the ordinance. Mr. Chairman, I'd make a motion to move item number 14 to the uh, top of our agenda now that it would be number seven and that seven would drop down below. I have a motion to modify the agenda and move 14. Do I have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 The agenda is now modified and we are now considering item 14, okay. which is a resolution R-2017-2243, a resolution approving Red Cliffs Vacation Villas development planned plan located north of Harrisburg and south of Leeds in a planned uh, development zone. Okay, and I promise that wasn't just a ploy to get out of the meeting a little bit earlier. <laughs> um, so the, the, the resolution with a, the with a PD development, a PD development is a little bit different and the zoning that's assigned to it is a little bit different than a standard subdivision. Uh, we have PD or plan development ordinance and it walks through uh, very specific details uh, that need to be in place before the zoning can be uh, assigned to that property. And so there are several processes. One is a schematic plan, um, concept plan, which is more of a concept plan. The planning commission reviewed that concept plan and made comments back to the applicant. There, it's a really kind of a fluid process. The next step was a project plan. Um, the project plan uh, came before the planning commission two months ago and then there were some changes that needed to be made so it came back again a week ago and the planning it the project plan meets all the requirements of our PD ordinance mm -hmm. and staff feels really comfortable with the project the project is located um, near Harrisburg um, kind of south of Leeds north of Hurricane and it's about 15 acres in size um, so I gave a copy of the project plan to the commission and so this resolution is approving that project plan. So what the, resi what the project, the PD zone is tied to the project plan and so in the future, let's say that the applicant ends up selling the property halfway through, whoever bought the project would either have to amend the project plan or go along with the project plan. And so um, staff rec the, both the planning commission and staff unanimously recommend a approval of the project plan which is addressed here in this resolution and then the follow-up the ordinance that's the next agenda item would be if the county commission approves the project plan then you can recommend approval of the zone change okay thank clear you. as mud mm -hmm. so i do have a question okay sewer yes so how what i mean so they, with utilities, they have a will serve letter for, from Washington County Water Conservancy yep. District, and they are working with Ash Creek Special Service District right now on coming up with a solution for that. Um, and Jared, who is the, this is his project, is here if you have any questions for him. Um, before they went into, too, it's not all designed, and before they go into too much engineering expense, Yeah. Um, they they wanted to get the project plan and zone change approval, but Jared is here if you have a question. Because this is sitting right above Quell Reservoir. Yes. And yeah. if there's any seepage into Quell Reservoir, our, our drinking will, 80, well, probably about 70% of our drinking water, I'm just concerned about that, and so. Yeah, it's, there's been a bunch of correspondence following up to the Washington County Water Conservancy uh, will serve letter and they kind of brought up those concerns and so did Ash Creek and Paul Wright with DEQ. Uh, they're all very aware of the project and have those same concerns. And Scott, before yes. they could actually build, let's just assume that they received the appropriate approvals in this meeting, all of those environmental concerns, especially with the wastewater and sewage, would have to be addressed. Absolutely, yeah, it would just follow under our 
much like any subdivision ordinance that or any subdivision that we have come through all of those need to be met before they could begin construction okay I am kind of curious about the renderings of the homes yeah so the it kind of looks like Fred Flintstone's village there yes. you know yeah. so but that's farther down the road of course yeah. after they get the sewer worked out yeah uh, Flintstones didn't have the sewer so no. yeah if they please yes because that's my major concern uh, thank you uh, my name is Jared Westoff um, Ash Creek's board actually voted to do a will serve letter for the project okay and so uh, I've met with Mike today who's Mike Chandler who is the director I, I don't know his official title there but um, and so we're just working through the details of how that uh, will serve letter and the agreement will come together. And so we do have the board approval. Now we're just working out the devil in the details. So did, did uh, Mike Chandler recommend it to the board that it be approved? He did. Okay, thank you. Yep, and the board did vote on that. And, and the main discussion was today was how do we do it um, so it's adequate for the project and with a little bit of an eye down the road for the area mm -hmm. and so just trying to figure out how to appropriately do that where the political situation for sewer in that area has been difficult so that's the other question is each unit going to be on their own septic system or is ash no no on? ash creek will come out because ash creek serves already uh, harrisburg right yeah so, so ash, ash, creek, ash creek has a lift station in harrisburg that is right currently flowing at only 8% capacity, and that line is going all the way around Quail. So for Ash Creek's ability to function, they would love to see more um, liquid moving through the Oh, okay, line. so this is just gonna go into that line? Yeah. Oh. So they'd like to see more liquid going into yeah, the line. Yeah, that's, okay. It's, it's, there's a sewer lift station you'll see on the project plan. Yeah. Um, when we get into site planning, that might move locations within the mm -hmm. 15 acres. Um, of the three or four sewer studies that have been done for that whole area, generally this has uh, been one of the lift stations, particularly in the SOMA <coughs> st study. So mm -hmm. while we are just planning for our project, we have kept an eye on the regional needs. Perfect. That answers all my questions. Yeah. Concerned, so thank you. So did you make a motion, Dean? I or? have not made a oh. motion. However. <laughs> Uh, I, I will go ahead and make a motion in support of the uh, project plan, resolution number 2017-2243, a resolution approving Red Cliffs Vacation Villas Development Plan located north of Harrisburg and south of Leeds in a planned development zone. I'll second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 I am glad to hear that you guys worked out your yeah. wastewater issues. We're back to uh, item number seven. Or, or what was originally yeah. seven and Scott I don't know if there's much else to report other than just tying with this project plan approval um, the pro the property is currently zoned a 20 um, there was an old the quail Creek RV plat mm -hmm. was part of this project or was on this property um, you know that was back in the 80s nothing ever happened it was defunct so the intent is that with, with this approval, they will then go back and amend or vacate that plat, removing that and just moving forward with the project. But uh, we recommend a, the public hearing was held and staff rec and planning commission unanimously recommend approval. Okay. So I'll, I'll do this one. So I go ahead and make a motion that we approve ordinance number 2017-11 Zero zero dash o an ordinance rezoning a certain portion of Washington County near Leeds from A twenty zone to P D zone hereafter here in after fully described in this ordinance. I'll second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. you. Um, on to item eleven, consideration of resolution R dash two thousand seventeen dash twenty two thirty seven, a resolution. Um, approving the interlocal agreement for a joint and cooperative action for explosive devices response 
And I'm glad that Corey's our so sheriff, of course, and Corey Pulse first. This is mostly just a matter of routine. Um, we have the bomb squad, which is federally funded and appointed, and they have different areas of service. And with the bomb squad we have here in Washington County, it's actually made up of participants from the different agencies before they can be approved um, by the feds to be able to go back and go through the, the training and everything, we have to get this in our local agreement. Mm -hmm. And we've had a couple individuals that have been retired and are leaving off the team, so we're trying to get the new applicants in. I um, mean, working with uh, the Hurricane Valley Fire District, they've come up with a couple applicants that think might be a good fit to come back on to participate so that we can maintain the five positions that we have as part of that bomb squad response team. Um, so before they can be accepted for the application, we've got to have this uh, memorandum with Hurricane Valley Fire District. Very good. Pretty straightforward. I, uh, being a member of the Hurricane Valley Fire District and present when it discussed and uh, voted on this, I think that when we cooperatively work with each other, we leverage our efforts and save uh, considerable taxpayer dollars. And so I make a motion in support of Resolution 2017-2237, uh, a resolution approving the interlocal agreement for a joint and cooperative, cooperative action for explosive device response. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Uh, item nine, consideration of resolution R-2017-2238, a resolution approving the expansion of the service offered by the Dameron Valley uh, Fire Special Service District to include recreation. Commissioners, I'd be happy to speak to this one as well. Uh, when voters approved the RAP tax in 2014, uh, the Dameron Valley Fire Special Service District, then prior to that it was a homeowners association. They maintained a small park immediately behind the fire station that had been owned by the homeowners association. When we created the special service district there, uh, it kind of orphaned the park a little bit and it was adopted uh, by the fire department in an effort to try and keep uh, a few swings and slides and a patch of grass for the grandkids and children in that area. Uh, pending a petition from uh, the special service district that they be allowed to actually do this and then we expand that charter to allow them to do that park uh, was an intriguing idea and we went up and had a public hearing uh, with the residents in Dameron Valley and really there was overwhelming support in favor of this expansion of the special service district. Following that hearing we went into a protest period and to my knowledge there were no uh, opposing uh, statements filed with the clerk auditor's office that uh, spoke against that and so I would recommend that we uh, approve resolution 2017-2238 that expands the services offered by the Dameron Valley Fire Special Service District to include that limited recreation. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Item 10 is consideration of resolution R-2017-2239, a resolution appointing members to the Southern Utah Sports Park Advisory Board. And I'll speak to this one. Um, just to follow up on this, uh, not very long ago, for quite some time, our shooting sports park has been operated by a special service district. Uh, that uh, district was set up for a variety of reasons. It's one of those reasons being allowing cities to participate but it also created kind of an unnecessary uh, layer of bureaucracy and so we've done away with that and uh, replaced it with an advisory board and with that um, is a need to to reappoint an advisory board we've kind of restructured it a little bit um, with that I'd like to make a motion that uh, we well can the chair make a motion I guess I can I'm gonna make a motion then um, that we approve um, the representative from Archery is, is Charlie Green, uh, Cowboy Action, Bill Christensen, um, Mountain Men, Pete Davison, um, Red Cliffs Rifle and Pistol, George Geo, um, Practical Shooters, Ken Nelson, uh, Purgatory Clay's Shotgun Venue is uh, John Freeman. Uh, members at large will be Kelly Larson, 
Gary Davis, and Dan Briggs. And I'd like to make that motion and ask for a second. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Was there any comments on that? I apologize as a chair. I got so no. wrapped up in making my own motion. It's been a while, so anyway. It's all good. Very good. We're on to uh, item number 12, consideration of resolution R-2017-2241, a resolution approving sponsorship for various events in Washington County. And we'll, um, I don't know if we, who's, who we want to speak to this or if we want to just discuss this. Well, let's let's have it. I mean, we have Roxy and Kevin here. And Very good, Roxy and Kevin. Here. If you'll come forward. So, um, thank you. Um, both of the um, applications that we're going to discuss today, the representatives are here, so I will let them speak to their perspective events, if that's okay with you. It's up to you, Chair. Very very good. Do we want to? Um, you know, we have two purposes in, in the current resolution. One was just to, to kind of, as we grab a hold of this process, um, I'm more than happy to let them speak to their events, especially is there concerns. So. I, I wouldn't be opposed at all to having Kevin and Roxy summarize them, yeah. though, and uh, tell us how their board uh, yeah, If we have any questions, we could ask them to speak and directly to if we have to any it. questions, we've got the... You ready to proffer testimony? <laughs> sure. Yeah. It's just that both of them have been sitting here since four o'clock <laughs> for their turn. But I'll go ahead. So the first one is we want to tell them first of all. Usually our meetings are not near yeah. this long, so we apologize. You know, please come back another time. We'll, we'll show you a, a very efficient meeting. Hopefully, you won't have to come back another time. Uh, the first event was the Family Roots Expo that was actually held last weekend. Just for a matter of public record, I guess, um, both of these events um, presented to our tax advisory board in May. Um, they were approved by that board to go before the commission for final approval. Why we're in this situation is because um, they turn in, we don't give them money ahead of their event, they turn in their receipts for reimbursement after their event or at the time of their event. So. I put through purchase orders, what, 30 days ago or something, anticipating that their receipts would be coming in, and that's how this whole red flag thing sort of started. So um, in light of that, they were approved by our tab board. Um, they're both private. They're not 501c3. They're private entities. Um, the Family Roots Expo was held at the Dixie Center last weekend. Um, I, I'd really prefer that they speak to the event if that's okay, because I don't know how it went. I haven't gotten a report yet. Or do you have any questions that I can answer? I think I'm, <clears throat> I'm fine. I don't know what the other commissioners are. I think this is just kind of a, a you know, a sharpening of our own process. So, so hopefully right. in the future, all of the approval um, will take place prior to the events just so that we can have any sort of deliberation at that time. I, it's almost like, the, you know. Right. And I think, I think we've discussed that. And, and that's the thing that I feel strongly about, that uh, when the horse is already out of the corral, expenses have been incurred, it, it, puts the commission, I think, in an awkward place to then vote. Are we voting to approve, or is it then becoming a, an affirmation of a decision that was already made? And since we are the legislative body, I just would like to uh, speak in favor of the process that would allow these to come uh, well in advance. and. Uh, I commend Roxy and the Tourism Board for the hard work that they do, and, and this is just a refining process, not a reflection on, on what's happening down there at all. But uh, <coughs> I'm happy to, to, to listen and find out what it is that we are. Approving. Very good. Well, with that, um, let's go with Family Roots Expo first, and then we'll uh, jump to, to Zion's Canyon Music Festival.
Hi, I'm Hi. Amy English, and I'm the owner of the Family Roots Expo. So I don't know if you have any questions first that you want me to answer, or if you just Tell want me to about give you Did you have a successful event? We did. Very oh, good. Yeah. So we had about 3,500 in attendance total with our two concerts and the event. And we have major sponsors that come into town. Some of those are Ancestry.com, Family Search, My Heritage, Roots Magic, and Living Tags. And I would strongly suggest we do this again next year that you guys come and meet these people because if they ever need a place of business to come, St. George is an awesome place. That's a wonderful for these, suggestion. For these I did businesses. notice in your application you had at least 140 confirmed hotel rooms at the time of, yes. of asking for the application. Yes. So. In fact, probably 80% of our presenters for the classes were from out of town, out of state, oh, or from Salt Lake area. Um, and we did hold it at the Dixie Convention, which brings the dollars back into our market. And I don't know if you're aware, but family history is the number one hobby in the world. So I have stats here from our website, and over a five-month period, there were over 47 states from the United States that looked at that website, as well as over 80 foreign countries that looked at the website. So that's all, you know, just bringing more into our market. Uh, another thing was the, we did have a nonprofit there. We raised over $4,000 for the Utah National Guard families at our veterans concert. Oh, so we try to tie nonprofits in, and as well as that, we brought in the Interfaith Council. And as far as I know, this is the biggest event that the Interfaith Council has ever been involved in, and they absolutely love it and want to come back. We had rabbis giving prayers um, from the Lutheran Church giving prayers, so it was a great event just to kind of bring our community together. Oh, thank you. I've only heard positive things about it. Yeah, I have a daughter right. that attended, and she came back, came home just super jazzed about how she thought the Interfaith prayer thing was really neat. Yeah, it gives, it's great exposure for all face. And we did, we had 350 youth that signed up for that event, so it was a great youth event as well. Good. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very welcome. much. Let's see, uh, Zion Canyon Music Festival. How's everything upriver? It's going pretty well, thank you. I'm, I'm Alexander Pelton, Lex de Acevedo. Uh, thanks for seeing us today. Um, it seems we were a bit confused, of course, when we were called forward to this meeting because we were under the impression in May that we had dotted all of our I's and crossed all our T's and everything was good to go. Um, so it was a bit of a shock, and, and it seems that this is more of a procedural thing of figuring mm -hmm. out where the future goes as far as paperwork. And we are curious about that as well because obviously we would love to be partners with uh, Washington County Tourism Office and yourselves for many years to come. Uh, we are in our ninth annual year of Design Candy Music Festival. Um, we've got a great event planned. It is in 10 days, so we're a little bit stressed out right now trying to figure out all the details. Um, we have spent a good deal of this money uh, that we, we thought was coming our way uh, from the Tourism Office, and we spent it on great things, advertising outside of the area. Um, we're quite confident that our festival is is a great thing for Washington County. Uh, definitely fills lots of hotel rooms. And just the fact that the first two words of our festival are Zion Canyon, when we advertise that around the country and the world, you know, it just puts that in people's heads. And even if they don't come to our festival, they think, oh, I haven't been to Zion in a while. We, be we better get back to there. So we feel it's a great relationship. Um, we're, we are excited by a move to the OC Tanner Amphitheater this year so we can take advantage of those great facilities that are just up the road from where we've been the last couple of years, um, last nine years. The other transition is that it was the town of Springdale running the event. Uh, I've been involved since the first day, uh, but uh, we, Lex and I took over ownership of the event this year, partly to protect the future of the event uh, with the changing of town councils and the potential use of the big ball field there in Springdale for other town purposes, buildings perhaps, we felt the best way to protect this event for the future for Washington County and for the citizens of the canyon was to take it over privately. And we do have a for-profit entity. The festival has never made a profit so far, so we're a little nervous about that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, we're, we're hoping this, this might be the year since now it's uh, you know our own, our own money we're playing with here. But, uh, but we are excited about this relationship and we, we do feel What does your relationship with the town continue to be? Uh, it's actually great. You know, some of the people on the committee were relieved to get it out of their hands. Some of them were sad to see it go. But uh, the, the town of Springdale, we, 
We wanted to ensure the community that we are still a community event, so something we proposed this year was on Friday night, anyone that lived in Springdale or worked in Springdale would get in free to the event, just to sort of continue that feeling of the community event as well as a, a you know, world-class festival. The town of Springdale stepped up and decided to pay for X amount of tickets for Friday for their citizens, and uh, they've also provided us with the infrastructure things as well. So for our relationship still is strong, and they're excited to see it stay in the community. So I think it's, it's going well. No, Mayor Smith is, spoke it, very highly of it. Yeah, is we're, this we're being proud. billed to the public a little bit as a public-private partnership? Uh, um, and we, I ask that question because it, in, in your application, your, your gate you thought would be $12,000, yet you're asking for 15000 from the county. And so it seems like uh, I'm just wondering how it's being marketed to the public, whether or not uh, how the public is benefiting from. Uh, uh, I think the, the public is benefiting from having a world-class festival right at their doorsteps that's only $10 a day. If this event was somewhere else, it would be a $40 or $50 a day mm -hmm. event, you know, and that's been our goal, is to try to keep it affordable for the citizens of the area. And obviously, if you just look at the citizens of the canyon, there's 500 of us. So, you know, we've got 2,500 seats to fill. So obviously, we're marketing most of those seats to people outside of the, out of the canyon. And we have done quite a bit of advertising in Colorado, in northern Utah, Las Vegas, and uh, with social media, we've been advertising all over the world. So, so uh, just from looking at surveys in the past, you know, a good deal of our guests are coming from outside of Washington County. So I know we're we're definitely filling hotel rooms, and uh, and uh, I'm confident that we're getting people as this continues to grow into a more. Uh, I don't know, a, a better festival or a, a more high-end festival at a low price. We're getting people from all over the place coming to this, and we have some bands now that are fo uh, following all over the country, so, hmm. so we're pretty exciting. I do have, I, I've presented this, I don't know who to give it to, but there's our, our poster for the year that suggests that the entities that are sponsoring at the top, all the sponsors are at the bottom, including the Washington County Tourism Office. We have. Uh, advertise that quite a bit. There's also in that packet all the all the bills we've spent, and and the fifteen thousand that we've asked for is primarily being spent strictly on marketing. You know, we've done radio ads in Vegas, we've done um, magazine ads in Salt Lake and Colorado. So we are using the money appropriately uh, according to the guidelines of the committee. So we we feel pretty good. There are obviously lots of other expenses other than. Mm -hmm. just advertising for this event so we, we are like I said we're, we're hoping for, for a profit this year uh, otherwise our wives are going to be mad at us so. <laughs> you might need to form a non-profit we had talked about that part of the the situation this year was that we proposed to the town that they handed this over to us at the end of this year's event and we talked about that in February and instead they said here you go it's yours today and so we were scrambling to set up bank accounts and LLP, tax ID numbers, all those kind of mm -hmm. things. We knew we didn't have an, enough time this year to do a nonprofit, and so we're still definitely deliberating on that. Uh, but this year we just had to sort of dive in and get it going. Oh, well, good. Well, I know the, the mayor did speak that he was, he was pleased that it was going to continue. He felt like the citizens had really, really appreciate it. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, and, and we've both been there since, well, I've been there since the very beginning, and, and uh, we were honored that they entrusted it to us and uh, that they understood our intentions and that we are, you know, primarily we want to keep the school festival in our community and in Zion Canyon and, uh, you know, that's our main goal. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank both of you. All right. Appreciate it. Yep. Well, I guess we'll just turn the time over to Kevin to, to go over these other four really quickly. As, as, uh... Yeah, I appreciate the, the time. As you know, the Office of Sports and Outdoor Recreation has a uh, a sports commission that considers monthly applications and, and uh, projects and things that are going on in, in relationship to sports and outdoor recreation. In the uh, August meeting, we considered three applications. Uh, one was for the Tri-State ATV Jamboree. The, that's been going on for a number of years, um, a, a great event with a great following, and they have about a $20,000, $25,000 budget that they use for uh, marketing and advertising, printing, and, and things like that. They came in this year. This is the first year they've uh, approached us for funding. Um, the, their proposal or their application was for $20,000 to assist in, in their marketing and, and advertising. 
Um, the commission reviewed that and uh, based on the nature of the event, um, the time of year that it was, um, their, their vision and growth plan, they didn't feel it warranted the $20,000, but we're very supportive of the event because it does uh, uh, really promote the brand and, and what we're trying to do here. Uh, so the proposal was for 2500 for the event in 2018, and that passed, uh, the, the motion passed and, and carried there. Second event was the Winter 4x4 Jamboree, which is another great event. It hasn't been going on quite as long, but it's, it's uh, seen some great uh, growth over the last couple of years. Um, that event is in January, which is a prime time event for us. Uh, January is a difficult time, and that's a great event that we can have um, in the area there. Um, their request was for $3,750. Um, their impact, and I, I forgot to mention the impact on the ATV Jamboree, but uh, the ATV Jamboree is 500000 economic impact. The, the uh, Winter 4x4 economic impact is about 800000 And uh, with their event, um, their budget is not quite so big, and they're a 501c3, and they donate um, their uh, proceeds back to land agencies and um, search and rescue and things like that. Uh, last year, they donated $27,000 back. So. Uh, their request for 3750 passed unanimously as well. Um, the third one was uh, the Nitro Circus event. I don't know if you know about Nitro Circus. It's an incredible event that started um, roughly about 10 years ago, but in the past four years, um, they, th these are um, anything that can fly type of a, a, a extreme sport demo. So they build ramps and launch things off of them and people try to fly and land them and uh, they've been all around the world. They've sold um, all over the world globally two million tickets in the last four years to their events. They sell out stadiums all over the world, massive stadiums. So they're doing a 10-year tour, anniversary tour, and uh, proposed St. George as a venue for that at Dixie uh, State University at Legend Solar Stadium next year in May. Um, their, their event um, is a bit more local, although they do say that uh, 30 to 40 percent of their participants are from out of town, and uh, it puts again a great uh, stamp and brand on this area to be selected as as one to host one of their anniversary events. It's, it's pretty powerful. Um, their uh, the real strength in their uh, event uh, is their is their market. They have 11 million Facebook followers. They have 800,000 YouTube uh, followers. They are all over the place. And they did a market survey uh, before they came here. They, they sent out a, uh, they, they produced a 3D movie that was in theaters. And um, per capita, this area had the, uh, by far the highest attendance at that movie of any other place that they distributed that in. So they know that we've got a market for that, and that's why they chose uh, St. George to do that. So we would get, uh, you know, the, all the benefit of their marketing. Um, they're going to spend about $65,000 in marketing the event here, which is fantastic. Well, so given they, the success of the Derby, uh, of the fair, I, I, <laughs> I'm sure that this, this county likes to see things. They like uh, they like to see things like that. Crash. And it's quite, a, quite an event. Um, they asked for $15,000, and that passed unanimously as well. Um, the final one on the list is, uh, and that would be May of 2018. So all of these are 2018 events. And the final one on the list did not go to the Sports Commission. Um, the, the commission has had um, voted that anything under $2,500, 2500 and below, they wouldn't require a presentation, that that could just be passed uh, via the staff. And so I, I looked at that. This is an event that we've um, hosted. This will be the third year for that event. It's a Western Regional USA Pickleball Tournament, uh, a great event. They had about 475 participants last year. They stay about two to four nights, um, representing 14 states and two countries. And uh, they requested uh, $2,500 this year to continue on with that. This would be the third year of funding for that event. And, and the final year in that in that category, and so I went ahead and uh, approved that based on their track record and and what's gone on in the past two years. So, those are the four events. I have a question about the Tri-State Jamboree. Why such a reduction? I mean, they've been a long established yeah. event. They they had their most successful year last year. Yep. So why um, why not twenty thousand or yeah. somewhere <laughs> or somewhere in between there? Yeah. Um, when, when you know this this committee um, is made up of sports folks and tourism folks, uh, city representatives and what whatnot. They've been doing this for a long time, and 
Um, probably the biggest biggest area issue is that's in April. It's it's a it's a major tourism time for us, and so the the impact of that event um, isn't as needed as other events. Um, the second thing was their vision. Um, they're they're kind of capped at where they can take that thing, and it and it felt like in the presentation that they didn't really have any intent to change that. That they weren't going to extend more days. Um, they weren't going to do anything else to alter the event. They were just going to go forward the way they were and, and just wanted some help in, in funding it. And so I think, I think the commission would be very supportive if they had some of that other vision and, and looked to be changing. But, but because there wasn't any of that and it was, a, it was more of a prime time, they felt like it didn't warrant the, uh, the, the amount that they were asking for. Well, last year they had to stop registration because we had it in the fair this year you know with more space and capacity i don't know i just um i don't know i'd almost like to pull them aside go yep. ahead and and vote on the others and then send it back for consideration and some discussion i i think that maybe we're missing the value on it and they could certainly come back and present for for additional again um, if we want to do that. Um, I know they're not necessarily a dynamic group. You know, yeah. Well, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> I, I know that, you know, they might, their presentation might have been, because I know the people, you know, involved and stuff, but I do think it, having been to their events, seen the yeah. amount of people that come, I mean, it's, they had a couple thousand people out of town at their dinners and whatnot, so I do think it merits a little more consideration than 2500 It's definitely a fantastic event. There's yeah. no question about that. And it fits the brand very well. And I, I think the commission was, was very receptive of that and, and want to continue to promote and market that brand. And, and like I say, there were just some of those issues that they felt like it, it didn't warrant the 20000 that they were asking for. Or they, couldn't, they didn't have the data to support that. And, and what was interesting is they, they were in the same meeting as the Winter 4x4 Jamboree who came in and, and asked, and asked for 3700 $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, And the economic impact was greater for the, for the winter 4x4 Jamboree. So there was a little bit of that, you know, this yeah. one only, only needs 3700 to be successful. Why does this one need $20,000? Uh, I think you're right, though. There's some things there that they do. The publication that they put out is um, very, very beneficial to tourism. They, they can't keep enough of them on the shelves. And so there may be some things like that that we could consider, consider um, as well in, in maybe supporting them in other ways that way. Would you America. want them to come back for more, or would you want to pull it? To, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I would like I mean, that's a long ways from 20 to 2,500. So, and I think 20 is probably excessive by quite a bit. Mm -hmm. but somewhere in between, I'd be a little more comfortable with. But at the same time, they have to make the case. I mean, you're right. What are, if, if they haven't made the case, you know, they haven't made the case, but. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, and I'm happy to pull them in and, and chat with them about that. I, I kind of indicated that in the, the letter that I sent to them following the thing that they're you know, these are the reasons that they, that they didn't get what they... It's not that I, that I oppose the 2500 So I'm okay with, if it'd be okay, um, pulling them and allowing Kevin to have additional discussion and bringing them back on another agenda. Would you consider instead uh, approving the 2500 and then just allowing Kevin to look at that? I have a lot of deference for the board, but... Uh, yeah, I think that would be I appropriate think we as well. Give them that certainty right yeah. now going forward. Very good. That figure out. Very good. So, so I'll go ahead and make a motion based on, on the, the presentations and the resolutions and information in our packet that we approve resolution number R 2017 2241, a resolution approving a sponsorship for various events in Washington County. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Motion passes. Aye. Item 13, consideration of resolution R-2017-2242, a resolution approving a web EOC end user license agreement between uh, ESI Acquisition Inc. and Washington County Emergency Services. Was this? So it's the same thing we had We just barely approved to pay them, right? So, so this would just be the contract. contract. I'd make a motion in support of the uh, resolution approving the Web EOC contract that we funded earlier uh, in Mark's purchase request, uh, resolution R-2017-2242. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion passes. 
Item uh, 15, consideration of resolution R-2017-2242, a resolution approving an agreement with Hughes General Contractor for the construction of Washington County Sheriff's Office Worker Housing Building. Nicole? Yes, yeah, so I just thought since um, Sheriff Pulsifer was here, if maybe we could team tag each other and if maybe you could explain to the commissioners a little bit more about the workers' housing building and what it's utilized for. So are you housing deputies in this building? Or? Can I? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, uh, Cheyenne, uh, we've got some modulars um, that uh, it's kind of an interesting story. If you go back to when the very reasons that we had to actually build a new jail, back in 95, 96, as uh, the old facility was only a 90 bed facility. They brought in a modular for temporary housing. As they were building the new facility and getting it opened up, they moved that building over there to help house for work release um, inmates, those that are on the state contract, able to go out and work in the communities. And it was expanded um, a little bit um, under the guise that it would be a temporary housing until something more permanent um, could be put in place. Um, here we are 20 years later, um, this year we'll be making the last payment, I believe, on the jail, and it will be paid off, and that temporary housing is still there. Uh, but it's starting to fall apart, and it's kind of uh, getting to be quite a hazard. If you jump off the upper bunk, um, you might just go through the floor. Uh, so this is a contract to actually build the new work release building. It'll be a permanent structure that'll be available to house those contract inmates that we house from the state, um, but to put them into more of a permanent uh, structure but keep them separated from the rest of the facility um, as we manage you know the inmates back and forth and so is this kind of a transition housing are these inmates close to the release date uh... um, these ones are ones that we get on the state contract that are anywhere from four to six years left but have worked their way through the system and proven themselves to be able to change their classifications then to be able to give special privileges and give them the opportunity to work so some of them help in the kitchens, they help with the laundry, but then they also get to the upper level where they can help um, with in the garden that we have there at the facility and with outside maintenance and also the work crews that you see along the highways that help with different cleanup projects, weeding and trash pickup. So, Well, I would like to applaud you for making that temporary housing last 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, very That's good. outstanding. So just um, for your information, Commissioner, so we um, put out to bid a CMGC, so a contract manager, general contractor, which allows the, co the contractor, the winning contractor, to work with the architect to finalize the plans prior to construction. And um, through the qualification process and the selection criteria that the county d determined to rank all of the contractors that came in, um, with the RFP, which by the way, we had incredibly well-qualified contractors. Each one that put a bid in was just incredible. Um, Hughes contract, general contractors, just slightly edged ahead of the other um, ones on the table. And so the, uh, the contract in front of you today is between Washington County and Hughes general contracting to um, allow the construction of the workers housing building and um, if you consider it today, we would um, ask that you do it to, um, I guess, Eric, so the county attorney would like to just review a little bit of our insurance qualifications that we have between. So a little bit of final negotiations Correct. on the language concerning the insurance and insurance requirements. Uh, I'd make a motion to approve resolution R-2017-2244 consistent with the successful negotiation by the uh, county attorney's office and the contractor on meeting those final insurance requirements. I'll second that. We have a motion second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. It's going to be kind of nice. Somebody needs to help uh, Commissioner Renstrom and his attempt to try and name the building because our current oh. name that he's thrown out there yes. isn't acceptable. I think Pulsifer Inn <laughs> is a wonderful name. I mean, yeah, I'm. I'm we can with change it to Pulsifer Hotel, bed and, bed and Breakfast, Resort, Vacation Rental. Thank you, Sheriff, for your Thank hard you. work. Thanks. No, we really do appreciate it. Well, with that, um, unless. Somebody wants to keep our meeting longer by saying more. Uh, we'll stand there. Very good. Thank you.